This episode is brought to you by Golf Kicks. Golf Kicks allows you to transform your favorite kicks into golf shoes. Everything from flip-flops to sneakers to Jordans will have you styling on the course. Head over to golfkicks.com today and at checkout use code OWN20. That's O-W-N-2-0 for 20% off your order. Golf Kicks, screw your shoes. Welcome to the show, everybody. Today is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 at Cole Caulfield. That's his second straight overtime goal. And former NFL receiver Chad Johnson is set to fight on the Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul undercard. Yeah, shit's getting pretty interesting out there in the sports world, and we're going to dive into it today. There goes that man's jock <laughs> Oh my God, did you see that? <laughs> America's team? Yeah, right. Oh baby, it's a big day in sports. There's nothing like battling it out with your teammates all season long to go win a championship. Green Bay's got it this year. Huge move for him. I think it's going to be a game changer. We have a lot to talk about this busy week in the sports world. Welcome to the In a League of Their Own podcast. All right, again, everybody, welcome. Uh... Again, as you mentioned in the intro, Chad Johnson is going to be fighting June 6th uh, on the undercard of the Floyd Mayweather-Logan Paul fight. Um, what's the latest with that, and why is Chad Johnson deciding to hang up his cleats and trade him in for some boxing gloves? Could be that he's overdue for a payday. Um, I think that could be one reason why that he's hurting for some money. Otherwise, he's just wants to get his name relevant again back in the in the world and i know he had his off the field antics after he was done like racing a horse and then he i think he raced Usain bolt did a whole bunch of like wild stuff like that because he is a freak athlete um so i think this is pretty cool to see a football player now stepping in for out of retirement to come throw some hands. So I think that'd be pretty cool. Hopefully he wins and then maybe we can see him and Jake Paul the next one. Yeah. Um, it's definitely interesting. I went to seeing Chad Johnson as a boxer, but also uh, I can't remember what podcast he was on earlier this or last week when he announced that he was going to be on that card um, on June 6th. But he said, he's like, I'm an athlete. He's like, I I'm, I'm pretty much good at every sport aside from golf. That's the only sport he said that he's tried and he just can't get good at. So but like you said, he's Chad Johnson's an amazing, amazing athlete, 40 some years old. Um, yeah. So it's going to be fun to watch there. Um, we'll kind of see what that amounts to if it's, he's just looking for a payday or if he's actually looking to get into the fighting industry. Yeah. And then talking about somebody else getting a payday, Alejandro Villanueva goes from Pittsburgh to Baltimore on a two-year deal, um, roughly about $16 million per season. This helps the Ravens' offensive line tremendously get Lamar Jackson some more help. I think this is really a, a cornerstone move for the Ravens, I think, moving forward after they lost to – who they, they lost to Kansas City, right? In the, the Ravens? Run? Yeah. Titans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The Titans did beat them. That's right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think this will be, you know, the Titans got better. The Chiefs pretty much have their same team. So, I think this is another step in the direction to maybe get them over the hump and into the AFC Championship game this year. So, I personally think that that was a great move. What do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, I – uh, Villanueva is a vet in the league. Obviously, any team. Uh, it was surprising to see Pittsburgh let him go. He's been just kind of that that cornerstone on that line. So, um, but it's always interesting to see a guy go to one of the division rivals. And the Ravens definitely could use the help. Um, as good as Lamar Jackson is a, a scrambler, I'm sure he doesn't want to be running for his life all the time. So, um, going out and in, in, uh, getting some better beef on that line is obviously a good move. Um, another, um, well, related to signings, but actually a decline in signings. Uh, after drafting Micah Parsons in their with their first round pick, the Cowboys are declining Leighton Vander Esch's fifth year option. Um, at first, it kind of came as a surprise. 
especially with how, aside from Sean Lee, especially with Sean Lee retiring now, Leighton Vander Esch was kind of the face of that defense and they declined his fifth year option. Doesn't mean that they're not going to sign him in the future. They just decided not to basically extend his contract for the meantime. But Micah Parsons, again, top rated linebacker coming out of the draft. So um, I guess depending on how Parsons does his first year, they might move on from Vander Esch. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see what happens there. And Van Der Esch is just a mediocre linebacker. I wouldn't put him in that good category. I put him at the average category. Um, with you drafting Parsons as high as you did, hopefully he's going to be – his play is going to elevate higher than, you know, that average play style, and he becomes a good slash great defender for you. Um, linebackers, too, are also always available in the draft in any single round. So I feel like it was a good choice, you know, saving some cash on the back end, not taking that fifth year option, especially how the season goes too. could it hit a complete turnaround too. As some people have said that this could be McCarthy's last year down in Dallas too, if he doesn't get things figured out and get them to the postseason. So, and then uh, I just have two more quick things here on the NFL is not really much has been happening. Jets defensive line in lineman Quinnen Williams is out eight to 10 weeks with a fractured foot. So that's unfortunate to see them to see him go down as he's kind of one of their big guys on their, on their defensive front. And then the Detroit Lions signed free agent Rakeem Boyd. Um, for those of you who don't know who he is, he was on last chance university the docu series on Netflix. This kid is an absolute beast of a running back. He was honestly one of my favorite characters slash players. I wouldn't really say character since it's real life. So I'd say he was, he was probably one of my favorite athletes throughout all the seasons of that show. He really seemed like he, you know, all these athletes who go to Juco, especially in football, it's either the grades or poor attitudes or, Usually it's off the field stuff that really is kind of what is holding these kids up as far as maturing and becoming a professional and being able to handle what you're supposed to be able to handle. Cause most of these kids come from D one schools who get cut and because they're trouble, no other D one school wants to touch them. So they go to Juco and then Juco is just unbelievable in college football. Cause you have basically have D one athletes on every single team playing against each other. So it's, it's pretty cool to see, but yeah, I, I think it's awesome. And I really hope he ends up making something out of this opportunity that he's worked so hard and put himself in, you know, he's put himself in this opportunity. Hopefully he makes it shine. Yeah. I mean, the Lions seem like they'd be a good fit for him. Um, again, Barry, Barry Sanders is obviously the, the, the greatest running back to ever come out of that franchise. And currently, um, uh, Swift is kind of their number one guy who, again, not really a top 10 running back. So um, I think him going there will definitely be a, a good fit and we'll probably get a lot of reps there as well. And then the last point I have on the NFL, just kind of a, I guess, a little talking point is that Jimmy G says, uh, voices um, about the Trey Lance pick and says that he's ready to help and mentor Trey Lance um, this season. Um, do you think that means that, or I guess he would, Jimmy G would know more than obviously we would as far as where he's going to land, if he's getting traded, things like that. But if he says he's ready to help and mentor, it kind of sounds like the, the 49ers plan to keep him around, at least for the meantime, to mentor the young quarterback um, out of North Dakota State. Um, so just kind of put to bed the the potential trade talks of Jimmy G or do you think that he's just preparing for the now and still he could get traded at any given day no uh, after they took Trey Lance that solidified that they weren't going to get rid of Jimmy G um like Shanahan said time and time again that they love Jimmy G and he's really good when he's healthy but it's when he's not healthy and when he's injured that their team really stinks so I feel Jimmy G is in the driver's seat here and he's going to either play himself to continue to be the starter or he's going to play himself to the bench. Um, I feel like San Francisco is giving him, you know, multiple opportunities to succeed with all like the weapons that they've brought in for him and have on their team. I feel like 
this is kind of the season where they're just like, okay, dude, you've been here two years. You've been hurt really one, or you've been here three years, but you've really been hurt two. So you really only played one and you took us to the Super Bowl. So is it, was that a fluke or can you do it again type of thing? I feel like he's really going to be put in that position this year. And if he doesn't succeed, I'd say by week 11, 12, 13, maybe you see Trey Lance make an appearance if that's the way that they're going to do things. But I feel like if Jimmy G has a great season and he does well, he's going to start this season. And who knows how much longer they're going to keep him because look at the Rodgers situation. He sat three, four years on the bench behind Favre before he even got in. So that could be the same situation with Trey Lance here if Jimmy G doesn't play himself onto the bench or gets hurt. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Uh, because of the the short stint that Jimmy G's been able to kind of prove himself in San Francisco, it's all been good when he's on the field. So again, that's kind of that question mark of it. Can he stay healthy? Um, is he getting enough reps on the field? Again, how we were talking about that he, he's really only good for 15, at most 30 passes a game where some of the kind of game managers like Brady Rogers are getting 40, 50 passes a game. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see this coming year. Uh, San Francisco is definitely set up to be pick up right where they left off two years ago with a Super Bowl run. Uh, so long as everybody can stay healthy. Last year, that injury bug ate that team apart, and um, everybody saw what happened with that. So hopefully, he gets a full year. And yeah, I'm sure Trey Lance will. Jimmy G will be a really good mentor because he Jimmy G got some antics, some. Um, some some stuff from Tom Brady in New England so obviously that trickles down over time so really in in essence Trey Lance is going to be getting some pointers essentially from Tom Brady that Jimmy G picked up from Brady so yeah we'll see what happens this year yeah we will definitely see what happens that's definitely for sure things are definitely getting interesting more and more by the minute I know I saw there was somebody that was cut on a team but that's not going to go through until after June 1st. They said on, on ESPN, I forgot what the name was of that player who was cut, but it was saving a team like $14 million or something. So you're going to start to see a lot more and more of this as the draft is over and their teams have to decide if they're going to sign their rookies or if they're going to move on from vets. It's kind of coming to that time around the league where you're going to see like Villanueva moving from Pittsburgh to Baltimore. You're going to see some of these vet guys moving from team to team here as guy as franchises really decide what direction they're going to go this season. Yeah. Um, switching gears over here to the NBA. Uh, the Lakers got back on track after uh, having a couple games skid. AD last night put up 25 as the Lakers edged the hot uh, – Denver Nuggets. I believe the Nuggets are on a five game win streak. So um, good to see the Lakers take them down, especially without LeBron. It was a low scoring outing. I actually watched the whole game last night. It was a good defensive game to watch. Uh, the Lakers won 93 to 89. So neither team broke 100 in a league where basically every night it's one teens to 140s, 150s. Um, so it was, it was a fun defensive game to watch. A lot of turnovers. Um, it was it definitely looked like playoff basketball. So it was, a fun, it was a really good fun game to watch. And kind of like we were talking about yesterday, we were kind of like eh, starting to get a little a little nervous about what was going to happen with the Lakers. And if the Lakers could take down one of the top teams in the West without oh, LeBron, man. they're kind of they're kind of sitting in a good spot. Um, I believe the Mavericks lost yesterday as well. So I believe the Lakers moved up from the sixth to the fifth spot. If I remember correctly from last night, if the Mavericks did lose, um, otherwise uh, it, they're at least still in the sixth spot. They're in the fifth. They're in the fifth. Okay. So half Dallas a game lead on Dallas and a full game on Portland now. Yeah. So Cause Portland lost seat. last night too. Yep, so they're in the driver's seat. Yeah, so with seven games to go there, um, so long as they, so long as they probably win four or five of those seven, they'll probably be sitting okay. Yeah, and then uh, 
For those of you who didn't see, Russell Westbrook secures a triple-double average season for the fourth consecutive season in a row for the first time in NBA history with 24 assists and 21 rebounds last night. Um, I thought this was absolutely insane. Um, he could average zero points, zero rebounds, and zero assists for the remainder of the season and still average a triple-double. That is just incredible that he could just go out there and pretty much do what he do what he does and average a triple double like it's nothing almost. And looking over the course of his four seasons that he's done it, his points started at 31 average down, down to about 23. His assists have went up and his rebounds have went up. So it seems like he's kind of turned off the individualness and turned into more of a team player now that he's in DC. Um sharing the ball a lot more instead of trying to do it all himself. It's great to see. And it'd be cool to see him um potentially end up on a team and go for a championship at, at some point. For sure. And it was interesting to see that uh Bradley Beal, uh Westbrook's teammate there in Washington, he said before before Westbrook came onto the team that he thought Westbrook was kind of a stat patter. He was just going for triple doubles, like um, just to make himself look good. But then he said, I, that completely tra- changed my perspective on him once I started to play with him and how he sees the court, how he works to get other guys open, get other guys looks. Um, I kind of thought the same thing as well when he was in OKC. Um, and even his short stint when he was in Houston, that he was just kind of like, I don't know, his ego was a little too big and he was just going for triple doubles just because he thought it lo- like it made him look good. But now that, like you said, his point averages per game have gone down, his rebounds and assists have gone up. He's more of the game manager and um, obviously looking to be more of a teammate than an individual scorer. Yeah, and how about Curry dropping 41 last night? That was pretty impressive to see that. And Draymond Green saying how teams are starting to fear him as he's heating up and they're potentially going to be in in that play-in tournament, which is going to be pretty cool to see Steph on the line shooting threes because I forgot what they said. He averages his average shot from the hoop is like 19 feet, which is pretty much as he's shooting a three-pointer every single time that he takes a shot, which is insane. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, I I didn't get to watch the full game, but I kind of saw the post game interview Curry talking about uh, what the uh, what the Warriors look like right now, and he said that even though they're in a good spot, I believe Curry has had nine forty point games this season, which I don't remember if that's an NBA record for a single season or if it's just for a franchise or whatever it was, but that's obviously a great number to hit. Not nine forty point games. That's that's just ridiculous. Um, but the one thing Curry did mention was that they're still playing inconsistent basketball. Right now, they they'd be they'd be in the play-in tournament, and at the play-in tournament, you got to be on a hot streak. Otherwise, if you're still playing inconsistent basketball like the Warriors are, um, by inconsistent being everybody outside of Steph Curry, because you know he's going to put up 30, 40, 50 points a night. It's going to be a matter of not whether other people can step up, play good defense, find the bottom of the basket as well. So. Um, yeah, great to see him still again after his um, after he broke Kobe's record for most 30 point plus games in a row. He had his one down game and then he just kind of picked up where he left off, um, kind of put all the haters to rest about was it just a fluke? He just wanted a little run for a little, a little while, but nope, he's right back to his his uh, Curry fashion. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Warriors come playoff time. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, and also it's, it's pretty neat to see Carmelo Anthony last night officially moved himself into 10th all-time on the scoring list. What a tremendous career, especially from being a superstar and then going out of the league, now coming back kind of on his second tour basically through. It's really neat to see him doing what he's done in the NBA. I mean, he was one of my favorite players growing up, not going to lie. I just loved his style, loved how he played when he was with Denver. Um yeah, he was, he was one of my faves. Yeah, um, yeah, great to see him again, c- kind of coming back, like you said, on his second tour. Hasn't really missed a beat. Again, him being in Portland, a smaller market franchise, uh, 
him out there with CJ McCollum and Dame Limmer, or Damian Lillard. Um, it's right now they're they're slated to be in the play-in tournament, but uh, yeah, you never know. Once it, Dame gets hot and Kamala Anthony gets to his spot on the on the right wing, he's unstoppable. So um, yeah, playoff basketball is just around the corner, and I'm really excited for it in a couple weeks here. Um, did you have any more NBA points? No, that's all I had for the basketball. All right. So Besides gonna... the Suns, they lost, and then now they're back into the second spot. But that's that's all. All right. I'm going to jump over here quick to the MLB, just a couple points. Uh, the Dodgers' young starting pitcher, Dustin May, is set to undergo season-ending season Tommy John surgery. So big loss for the Dodgers there. Um, again, Tommy John surgery – basically takes you almost a year kind of like an ACL injury to recover from so hopefully he'll be back next year and ready for the Dodgers uh the New York Mets fired two of their hitting coaches due to their struggle at the plate uh they're pretty much at the bottom of the league in almost every category as far as um hitting average home runs on base percentage all that kind of stuff so the Mets made an early or made a move early in the season here to try to get them back on track um, over to the, our Brewers here. They dropped their first game last night in Philadelphia, four to three, a place that they usually dominate. I believe that they have, I think it was like 6.7 or 7.6 runs per game that they average in Philadelphia, which is the most of any team in the MLB. So for whatever reason, the Brewers are always hot in Philly. Um, again, that was just the first game last night. They're back in action at six o'clock tonight. So hopefully they can get back on track there. Um, also great to see last night, Yelich and Kane were back in action after their injuries. Kane went one for four with a solo shot in the first and Yelich went two for four as well. So, um, good to see both of them get uh, a hit or at least a hit each. And then lastly, uh, Miami Marlins will be without pitcher Paul Campbell after he tests positive for steroids. Um, I believe it's a six, either 60 game, I think it's a 60 game or 90 game suspension or 90 day, whatever it was. Um, uh, the, the MLB is out is always been known for guys getting caught with the roids and um, just another story of it here. So see what happens with that. But the Marlins are kind of becoming irrelevant. They had a, they started off really or good this year. I think they were like one of the top teams after like, seven or eight games and then they just hit a big skid now without one of their pitchers ripped to their season already and not even a quarter way through so that's all i had in the mlb yeah and then jumping over here to the nhl last night cole caulfield and that's his second consecutive overtime game winner um against the toronto maple leafs what a fucking snipe Puts it off the right bar into the net. Uh, beautiful saucer pass from Petrie again, who set him up on his first goal in overtime uh, the, the day before. Pretty freaking sweet to see that happen. Um, I was yelling at the TV. I was so pumped when I saw it happen because I, it was like the same thing as his other goals. Like you could see the amount of space that he had. And for the, him watching him play for over the last however many seasons he's been playing ever since he was U18 for USA, you, you were able to watch him play main stage top level hockey. And he was able to score time and time again at the big stages and the big moments. And he does it again last night. I think that just goes to show that he's just going to be a natural born goal scorer in the NHL. And that's going to be kind of his role here. Um, the team's been continuing to poke fun and make jabs at him while he's continued to do well. And last night they posted a graphic. He's tied Wayne Gretzky now for a regular season overtime game winning goals at two. So that was pretty, pretty hilarious to poke fun at him, hoping that he keeps up that play as they continue to move forward as now they're tied with Winnipeg for that third spot in the Scotia North. Those two teams are battling basically for the third and fourth seed in that division Crucial games are coming up as I believe Montreal has two games left against 
the Maple Leafs and then two games against Winnipeg. So those are going to be crazy intense battles as they're going to battle to see who, who's got to play Toronto and who's got to face McDavid and the Oilers. Matthews also netted a goal again last night, puts him at 39 goals on the year in a regular season. He would be, he'd be on pace for 66, which is incredible. Kid just can't seem to not score. Um, He's always in the right spot, how he moves the puck really quick off those angles before he takes those shots. He's just a born sniper. Um, Awesome again for USA hockey to see a U.S. born player taking the lead in the goal scoring. It's awesome to see. Then jumping over to um, Dallas and yeah, jumping over to Dallas here, who is one of the other teams on the bubble with Nashville fighting for that last playoff spot. They get one of their superstars back. Who's Tyler Sagan made his return after 160 days from two knee surgeries. He skated last night and made his comeback. He scored a goal and they ended up making it to overtime and getting one point in the loss. Huge point for them is they need every point that they can get as they're battling for that last spot out there in the West. Um, <clears throat> Boston secures the last playoff spot in the east so that's pretty much locked up they're just fighting for positioning now in the east the blues basically have the west locked up um in the west so uh, i'm sorry dallas um that's in the east no all these fucking division changes dude all these names are just messing me up so bad I apologize to all the fans out there. Go ahead and roast me. I'll take it. That's in the Central Division. I'm, I apologize. So the Stars are battling with Nashville for that last spot in the Central Division. The Central. Um, yeah, McDavid last night. They win 5-3. to three. He had a few points. He's now at 91 points. He's definitely going to hit 100. That, that's no question. Um, down in Florida... Sticking with the central Spencer Knight, rookie goaltender makes NHL history as the first goaltender to go four in O in his first four games in the NHL. Shout out to Spencer Knight, U S development program prospect made it through the whole ringer there. So USA hockey's on the up and up with the young kids coming in. Um, It's really neat to see that as well. And then the last bit of news here, For those of you who didn't get to watch the Washington Capitals New York Rangers game last night, Tom Wilson received a $5,000 fine for slamming Panarin's head off the ice multiple times. I think that was a bullshit call. I feel like he should have been ejected or the Rangers should have beat him to a bloody pulp right there out on the ice. Um, I definitely think Tom Wilson is one of those players who plays on that line. He does cross it more times than not because he is that that type of player. Um, you hate to see it when it's taken to a guy where he doesn't have a helmet on and you're, you're slamming his head on the ice. Like, that can really do some big damage there. So I really feel like player safety needs to take a second look at this and potentially give him a sussy here, maybe even keep him out the rest of the year of the regular season and give him a bigger fine than that because – the NHL as basically every sports industry now is your top players are the guys you kind of protect and you are the guys who make you your money. Artemi Panarin for the New York Rangers. He's the guy that brings in big bucks for that team and New York Rangers, Madison square garden, one of the biggest markets because of the population, you can't take out their top player and expect nothing to happen. So I feel like there's definitely going to be more repercussions coming here as the days continue. And then last bit of news is the United States U18 team got downed last night, five to three by Sweden. So their run has come to an end. Canada won 12 to three, I believe, or 14 to two, something crazy. But for those of you who haven't watched their team, that team has three, the three next future number one picks. So next year's number one pick, the next year's number one pick, and the 23. So from now until 2023, they have the number one picks on their team. Uh, the 15-year-old who's the 2023 guy, his name's Connor Berard or Bernard. 
He's leading Team Canada in points as a 15-year-old. Um, insane what he's doing there. And then there's another kid who's on Russia, I think, who's also a 15-year-old who's leading the, the whole tournament in points. He's got like 13 or 14. Just incredible how young these kids are who are just tearing it up. Like, it's really, it's really amazing to see how young these kids are getting who are able to play that competitive and that top tier level of hockey where pretty soon you're going to start seeing, I mean, the average age of the NHL right now is like 24 years old, 23 years old. I'm guessing in the next five years, that's down to about 20. Because just for the sheer raw talent of how these young kids can skate and move. And it's gotten away from the physical fighter type of, where you don't have kids growing up learning how to fight and, and stuff, you know, they're learning how to score goals. All these kids want to score goals. Now it's not about being the tough guy anymore. So yeah, that's all I really got for, for hockey. I mean, it's getting interesting. Blackhawks basically put the nail in their coffin tonight. If they lose against Carolina and that's the only game worth anything that's going on tonight. All right. Yeah, that's all I had for today as well. A little bit of a shorter episode, but I mean, we can only talk as much as the sports world gives us. So, um, yeah, we're excited to dive into tomorrow. Uh, t- tonight, again, uh, as, I, as I'd mentioned, yesterday's episode, the Bucks and Nets have their second matchup uh, in Milwaukee. So I will definitely be watching that tonight and uh, kind of, see how that pans out see Giannis and Durant go at it again so excited for that um and then also uh for one of our next guests next week Tuesday we got some details finalized there we'll be having on comedian actor and again uh golf fanatic Jake Adams uh Tuesday at noon uh so watch out for that interview we'll be back live here um obviously tomorrow but just look out for that interview next week excited to have him on Um, yeah, so again, wrapping things up today here again. Thanks everybody for stopping in. Uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. More sports news, more sports talk. Uh, not sure if we have an interview for you guys yet this week, but again, uh, we try to have at least one a week, so we'll let you know if that happens. So take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>